Can you still come to my team to play? I think that's on four four four. We are going to do it and we need to see. We've already done a video here and we need to one. And this is the continuous method. And this is the one. As we have been doing, if you are watching this video, can you like, subscribe, and share so that any time you have a video, we will post a video of this person, you have access to it. So, let's get started. Let's move to the objective for today. So now today, our uh, objective is to know what an engineer is and look at some of some simultaneous situations and we also tackle problem identification. Yeah, so let's get started. So let's start with the simultaneous equation models. So simultaneous equation models are a type of statistical model in which the dependent variables are functions of other dependent variables rather than just independent variables right? so now our main focus wouldn't be the definition for simultaneous equations here if i ask that how do we solve to or what does it mean to solve two equations simultaneously we see solving two equations at the same time here yeah. so now what this uh, definition is trying to say is that when we have a given set of equations, okay, and the dependent variable happens to be an independent variable A, a different equation, okay, and at the same time it happens to be a dependent variable. So let's look at this example here. So now it says we should consider a closed economy without government intervention. Okay, so here. We have y to be equal to so for a closed economy we don't have, we don't have anything like a net export okay so this makes it closed economy so we have y to be equal to c plus i plus g i okay and the second equation we have c to be equal to beta naught plus beta one y minus t so this is the disposable income this is the consumption function i okay disposable income is income minus taxes okay so beta naught plus beta one y minus t plus epsilon one okay so what peculiar thing that what peculiar thing can we see here so we see one thing equation one c is predicting y but then when we come to equation two y is predicting c okay why is predicting c so that's what this equation or this definition is trying to explain okay so when we have a statistical model where the dependent variable are functions of other dependent variables okay so in we term that definition as simultaneous equation. So in, 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 in a simpler things, when we have um, different or independent equations or systems of equations, where the dependent variable tends to tends to uh, predict each other, okay, then we have simultaneous equation. So when we have this form of equation, we can't estimate um how do you call it? We can't estimate the the regression coefficient or the parameters here that beta not and beta one so we have to, for it to be able to estimate you have to get independent equations where the dependent variables in there doesn't predict each other okay so this is what he's trying to say this why is the dependent variable in equation one by independent variable in equation two yeah why is dependent variable in equation one by it is an independent variable in equation two c is a dependent variable in equation two but independent variable in equation one so c is an independent variable in equation one but it's an independent variable in equation two and right? so when we have a scenario like this we say we have a simultaneous equation condition okay uh, so as i said earlier when we have a scenario like that where the dependent variable tends to predict tends to predict each other in a given set of equations then we cannot estimate the regression coefficient we have to get a, a set of equations where the dependent variable doesn't predict each other so we can do that by means of solving the two equations simultaneously to get the systems of equations so now let's move on so let's run through this solution okay let's solve these two equations simultaneously so let's run through the solution here and we'll come back Wait. 
Maintenant, so these two questions are the equations that we saw in our previous two slides. Okay. They are saying that this is the closed economy. Okay. And this is the disposal, sorry, the income function, sorry, consumption function. Okay. And these are disposable income. So now, and in the question, the previous two slides, we saw that there is no government intervention. So it means that taxes and government expenditure will map to zero. Taxes are a form of revenue to government. So if there's no government intervention, so there is no need for us or for we having taxes in our equation. So our new equation will be, our equation one will now be y to be called C plus I. So here will be my equation three. And here omitting T, my equation two will be beta naught plus beta one Y plus epsilon I, sorry one, that's my equation four, okay. So now we are solving these two equations simultaneously. So solving these two equations simultaneously, when I take equation one, I have an element of C, so I can just substitute C, that's my equation four into equation one, in order to find my Y. So when I put, um, before then, let me try and, so now, in every economy, we want to maximize output, I think. So the motivation here is we want to find the equilibrium output, the maximum output at which that economy will produce. So that's what you are looking at. So that's why we solve these two equations simultaneously to get the equilibrium level of output and the equilibrium level of consumption because consumers also want to maximize their consumption. So you have to look out for the maximum consumption of produce that they can produce with the maximum consumption. So now, when I substitute equation two into equation one here, okay, and I substitute equation two into equation one here, this is what I end up getting. So my aim is to find the equilibrium level of what output, that's why. So I'll group the entities which are to y, sub y in them. So I'll bring this, I'll group the y's at one side and the one without y at the other side. So I have my ones with y at the left hand side and those without y's at the right hand side. So the common factor here is y. So when I factor y out here, I mean, I'll end up getting y into one minus beta naught to be called beta naught plus i plus epsilon one. So me aiming at getting the equilibrium level of output, so I think I have to make y the subject by means of dividing two by one minus beta one. So when I do this division, I end up getting y star, that's my equilibrium level of output, we go to beta naught on one minus beta one plus one over one minus beta one i where i is my investment plus epsilon on one minus beta one okay so now if you can recall in our previous lecture on endogeneity one we say that the problem of endogeneity must uh, is said to have occurred when the assumption of endogeneity is violated i think so when there's endogeneity then there will be a relation sort of relation between the reverser and the error thing and we found out that when we're proving um, the, the, the endogeneity in our previous lecture, we found out that we will only get endogeneity, or we can say endogeneity has arise when the equation or the regression equation that we end up, the error term has an element of the parameter in it. So for example, look at this example, after we found the equilibrium level of output, when we look at the error term, the new error here, it has an element of beta one. So it means that there exists some relationship between the regressor, that's I and the error term here. Okay, so it makes it endogenous. So this scenario will be able to prove what endogeneity one. Now, let's continue. Let's find the equilibrium level of what consumption. So when I look at equation four here, I have an element of y, so I can substitute equation three into equation four. So when I do my substitution, this is what I end up with. I'll expand the brackets, and I'll end up getting this. I'll group the ones we see at the left hand side and the ones without C at the right hand side, and this is what I end up getting. Common factor here is C. So you factor C out, and this will be your end result. So now we are looking out for equilibrium level of consumption. That's C star. So in the C, the subject, I have to divide two by one minus beta one. And this is what I get. And my C, my equilibrium level of consumption, that's C star here, 
is equal to beta naught on one minus beta one plus beta one on one minus beta one. So let's make plus the epsilon on one minus beta one. So my stochastic error here has an element of the parameter or the coefficient here, which makes it what endogenous. So if I represent beta naught on one minus beta one to be equal to theta naught and sorry power naught and one on one minus beta one to be power and epsilon star to be equal to one epsilon one on one minus beta one and power two to be equal to beta one on one minus beta one. So wherever I see beta naught in this equation, wherever I see beta naught on one minus beta one, I have to substitute it for power naught. And when I see one on one minus beta one in any of the equations, I have to represent it with what power one and epsilon star. Wherever I see epsilon on one minus beta one in power two, wherever I see beta one on one minus beta one. So when I do those substitutions, this is what I get. So I've gotten my new output, equilibrium output to be this. That's power naught plus power one. I, that's my investment plus uh, epsilon. And sister, that's the equilibrium level of consumption to be equal to power naught plus power two. I plus epsilon as my equation. So, so this my, these are my new equations. So now when I compare these two new equations, I've got in here two equations three and four here. When I compare them, you see equation one doesn't have see these two equations doesn't have the dependent variable predicting each other. Unlike this equation three, you can see that C was predicting Y, but then Y tends to predict C in equation two. Okay. So we don't have, when you take this equation 7 and 8, none of the dependent variables predict each other. The only uh, exogenous variable or the variable that predicts Y and C is the investment, that's I. Okay, so when we have a scenario like this, we can estimate the regression coefficients. That's the B test. So when you have a scenario like that, we can estimate the regression coefficient. So let's look at an example here. Let's look at an example here. They are saying that with appropriate data for Y, C, and I, assuming applying OLS to 5 and 6. So here, when I apply OLS to, so here would be mine would be 7 and 8. Okay. Good. So assuming this. This seven and eight end up giving us this result. Yeah. So this is my seven and eight. We are being asked to, we are looking at this example, we are being asked to estimate the model, but estimate the regression model. Okay. So what they are trying to tell us is to find the regression coefficient. That's beta naught and what beta one. So that's our eight. Mind you, this is not beta one naught, this is uh, power naught, this is power. This is power naught and this is what power two from previous slide. Right. Let's move on. Let's work through the solution. So this, these are the same equations that we saw here. Seven and eight. So this is it. So if y to be is equal to five point zero plus one point two five i, if I represent it in my equation one. And C not different from 5.0 plus 0.25i as my equation two. And with this formula, with this formula where I noted beta naught on one minus beta one to be equal to pan naught, means that wherever I see pan naught in this expression here, I have to substitute it for 5.0. In this solution here, my power naught is now 5.0 and it's supposed to be equal to this expression as we saw in the previous two slides. So this is that. So I'll cross multiply and I'll end up getting this. I'm simplifying this. I'll group the one, the parameters at one side and the ones without parameters at the other side. And this is giving my end result. 
and I labeled it as equation three. Okay, now let me look at power one. So power one also has its formula. Power one is equal to one on one minus beta one. So whenever I see power one, I have to substitute it for one point two five. So one point two five is equal to this. So do my substitution and my simplification. So I'll cross multiply. I'll cross multiply here, and I'll end up getting when I cross multiply and I simplify. This is going to be my entry, but this very simple end. I trust that you all can do it. So this is my beta one here. So I'll put or I'll substitute my beta one into equation three in order to find beta naught. So when I do the substitution and simplification, this is what I end up getting for beta naught. Okay. So this procedure we use to estimate for beta naught and beta one is termed as indirect least square estimates method. Okay. Indirectly square estimate method. So this is the method that we use. So the method we use to estimate for beta naught and beta one is termed as indirect estimate method. So this is the same thing we did here. Okay, so this is the solution. You can take your time, go through it, and you will be fine. Okay. So this is what he's trying to say. Solving the above relationship indicates beta naught to be 4.0 and beta 1 to be equal to 0.2. So that's what we showed in this slide. And as I said earlier, this procedure of estimating beta naught and beta 1 is referred to as the indirect least squares method. I think indirect least squares method. So, and in the previous slide, we were able to prove that if we have an endogenous equation, or the estimates are endogenous, then we can the parameters to be unbiased. Okay, so the estimates beta naught and beta one are said to be appropriately estimated and they are unbiased. Yeah, we showed it in the previous lecture. For negative one. So let's go through these equations and we move on. So they are asking us to consider these three equations. And what do we see here? We can see that. In these three equations, the dependent variables are predicting each other. So it makes it what endogenous. Okay, and with this, we cannot estimate the regression coefficients. That's the alpha one, two, 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 beta three, three. Okay, we can only estimate for the regression coefficients only when we have been able to get a system of equations where the dependent variables are not predicting each other. So when I talk of the dependent variable, then I'm talking of y1, y2, y3. So with this system of equation, they are saying that y1, y2 are endogenous variables because they, they are dependent variables in one equation, explanation variables in another equation. Yes, I've said that here. So when I look at for equation one here, y2 is an independent variable in equation one, but it is a dependent variable in equation two. Y3 is an independent variable in equation two, but it's a dependent variable in equation three. Y1 and Y2 are independent variable in equation three, but then they are dependent variable. Y1 is a dependent variable in equation one, and Y2 is a dependent variable in equation two. So you can see that y, Y1 and Y2, Y1, Y2, and Y3 are endogenous variable. Why are they endogenous variable? Because they are dependent variable in one equation and explanatory variable in the other equation. So when they ask you to define what endogenous variable is, it's just simply you just see that they are variables that predict each other in different equations or different forms of equation. X1, X2, and X3 are exogenous or predetermined variables because they determine why, but not influenced by any variable. So they are independent, they are not being influenced by any, they influence the Y, okay? So that's why we can them as exogenous, they don't have any impact, sorry, they have impact on other variables, but then other variables doesn't have any impact on them. That's why we can them as exogenous variables. So let's move on. Our E1, E2, E3, A, is termed as our stochastic disturbance or the random error things or residuals. Alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, 1 are the coefficients of endogenous variables. Yes, these are endogenous variables. 
y1, y2, y3, and the coefficients are alpha 1, 2, alpha 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 3, 1, and 3, 2. They are endogenous coefficients, okay, or coefficients of the endogenous variables. And beta 1, beta 1, 2, beta 1, 2, 3, and beta 3, 3, three are the coefficients of the endogenous variables. Okay, so that's the beta 1, 1, beta 1, beta 2, 3, beta 3 are the coefficients of the endogenous of three determined variables. So now, the system in the previous slide, that's this slide, these equations are termed as structural or behavioral equations. Why are they structural or behavioral? These, these equations have the dependent variables predicting each other. They are termed as structural or behavioral equations, systems of equations. Okay, and the alphas and the betas are the structural parameters. Yeah. So, None of these equations can be estimated by OLS of, of the uh, evaluation of the endogenous. What this thing is trying to do is trying to define what endogeneity is. So we are doing endogenous variable endogeneity, I think. So now, when we evaluate the assumption of endogeneity, then we have endogeneity problem. Okay, so now, let's move to our next discussion, which is problem identification. There are basically three types of problem identification. We have over identification, exact identification, and under identification. So, what is over identification? A regression equation in a system of equations is over identified if one, the number of unknown behavioral parameters is less than the number of reduced form of coefficients. Okay. And that solving the unknown parameters, one or more unknown behavioral parameters is good have more than one unique value. So we try and understand them in the next, I think the next three slides or two slides. So I'll, I'll do my more light on that. So let's just look at the definition for them. And when we say exact identification, a regression equation in a system of equation is said to be exactly identified if one, the number of unknown behavioral parameters is equal to the number of reduced form of equations, and that too, in solving the unknown parameters, each unknown behavioral parameters has a unique value. Okay, and when we talk of under identification or unique unidentified, it's a regression equation in a system of equations where one, the number of unknown behavioral parameters is C the number of reduced form equation. Okay, now I would use the rules for identification to throw more light on the over identification and the over identification, under identification, and the exact identification. So I'll use these rules of identification. There are basically two rules, two, two rules of identification, which are other identification and rank identification. But this lecture is going to focus on the other identification. Okay. So now, let's quickly look at a definition for, or let's quickly look at what other identification is. For other identification, the rule is to compare the number of variables excluded from the equation under consideration and the number of equations minus one. So what this try, what this is trying to say is that. Number of variables. So, for example, when I take this equation, for example, I'm going, I'm trying to compare the number of variables to let's say, for instance, equation one. I'm taking equation i. Like this is equation i for one. I'm trying to compare the number of variables excluded in equation i to the number of structural equations or equations minus one. So here will be one, two, three. So three minus one will give me. So when I compare the number of variables excluded in equation one to the number of structural equations minus one. Okay, that's what the first order talks about. Okay, so after comparing and I end up getting the number of variables excluded being greater than excluded in the equation being greater than the number of equations minus one, then we see we have 
over identification. Okay. But then when I have the number of variables excluded in a given equation, okay. When when I have the number of variables excluded in that in a given equation being equal to the number of equations minus one, then I have exact identification. And when I have the number of variables excluded in an equation being less than the number of equations minus one, then I have under identification. Okay, so you, I, I'll throw more light on it. So let me try and work some example here. Let me use this same example to and same equations to explain. Or better still, let's move forward. Let me look at example. Let's look at some important notation as we move on to get to understand what I'm trying to say. So now, important notation. So we are representing or we are denoting k to be the total number of variables in the entire system of equations. Now let's come to our previous slide. How many systems of equations do we have? We have three systems of equations. I, 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 and I, I, I. So k is the total number of variables available in these three systems of equations. So when I'm talking about variables, I'm talking of y1, y2, x1, x2, and x3, and y3. Okay, so when I'm talking of variables, I'm talking of y1, y2, y3, x1, x2, x3. Alpha 1, uh, the alphas and the betas are known as or I think that's parameters or regression coefficients. They are not variable. So when I'm talking of variables, they are the y's and the x's. Okay, so now, so the total number of variables in these three systems of equations are what, six. I have y1, y2, y3, I have x1, x2, and I have what, x3. So in effect, I have three, the total number of variables in this system of equations is three. So our k here, sorry, six. So our k here is what, six, okay. Now, M, M is denoting the number of variables in a particular equation under consideration. So let's look at equation one. So now when I'm looking out for M, I'm looking out for the number of variables available in equation one only. So when I take equation one or equation I only, the number of variables available here are Y1, Y2, Y, X1, and X2. So the number of variables available here are what, four. Okay, this for equation one. Then I come to equation two. The number of variables available are y2, y3, and x3. So the number is what three. So the variables available in equation three are y3, y1, y2, x1, x2, x3. So in fact, they are what five in equation three. So that's m. So when you talk of m, m is the number of variables available in a particular equation. Okay. So g. Change the structure of behavioral equations in the system of equations. So here, when you take this system of equations, the G is the number of equations. So we have equation I, equation two, and equation three. So the number of equations here are what, three. So that's our G. Now let's quickly look at some example or exercises here so that you understand what the I used to explain what the over identification when we say what well, exact identification and when we say under identification, you get to know them their meanings. So let, let's look at the first example. But then the preamble says that use the other condition to indicate the identification status of each equation in the following system of equations. Okay, so you have been given the market cycle level, that is demand and supply analysis. So this is our demand. Our demand is giving us Q to look at alpha naught plus alpha one P plus alpha two y plus p one that's my demand equation and my q is giving us beta one plus beta beta naught plus beta one p plus p two as my supply equation okay okay so i want to know whether these two equations for example when i take equation i want to know whether equation one was over identified whether it was exactly identified or it was under identified. So that's my A. Likewise, when I take equation two, that's my supply equation, I would want to know that whether the supply equation was over identified, whether it was exactly identified, or whether it's under identified. So let's walk through the solutions here. Let's walk through the solutions of this question. 
So now, so this is the solution to the exercise. So given the system of equations, so these are demand and supply equations. So Q to be equal to this as our demand, and Q being equal to this as our supply. Now knowing that Q K here is our total number of variables. So I take which one and two. The total number of variables here. The variables we see here are what Q, P, and what Y. So the total number of variables we see here is our three. So we have three number of variables available in both equation one and equation two. Now, M is our number of variables in a given equation, and G is the number of equations. So then how many behavioral equations do we have? We have equation one and equation two, they are just two. So now let's take equation one. So when we take equation one, the other condition says that we should compare the number of variables excluded in a given equation to the number of equations minus one. So when we compare the number of variables excluded in, a, in an equation and the number of equations minus one here. So my number of equations, sorry, this variable, then my number of variables excluded here is k. That's the total number of variables minus the number of variables in equation one. So when I take equation one, the total number of variables in the entire equation are three. So the number of variables available in equation one are just one, two, and three. So they are also three. So my number of variables excluded will be k minus n. That's three minus three, which will give me zero. Okay. I'm comparing it to what the number of equations minus one. How many structural equations do I have to? So two minus one here will give me one. So what do we see here? You can see that the number of variables excluded in equation one, that's k minus m here, is less than the number of equations minus one, that's g minus one. So zero is, B is less than one. So hence, when we have this scenario, we see that the system of equation is was under identified or was under identified. Okay. So this indicates under identification. So let's take equation two, three and work through it. So now, similarly, when we compare the number of variables excluded in equation two, that's k minus m. That this one is not the number of variables excluded, and the number of equation minus one that's g minus one. I k let's see the effect. So, the number of variables available in the entire equation are three that's q, p, and y. So, when I take equation two, the number of variables available in equation two that's my m, they are just with q and p, so they are just two. So, let's look at that. Let's look at this one. So now my m is two. So when I compare with k minus m, three minus two. Sorry. Good. K minus m, three minus two will be equal to one. G minus one, that's two minus one will give me one. And we can see my number of variables excluded in equation. Two, that's question one. Is 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 equal to the number of equations minus one, one one. So this indicates exact identification. So where wherever whenever I have the number of variables excluded in a given equation or in a particular equation being equal to the number of equations minus one, I have exact identification. Let's move to this example two. Good. So now let's consider this system of equations. Okay, equation one is Include the economy equation. I have y to be equal to c plus i plus g. Equation two is c to be equal to consumption function. That's c to be equal to autonomous consumption. That's theta naught plus theta one y plus epsilon. And I have my investment function to be equal to delta naught plus delta one y plus delta z k plus mu. Okay, so now let's take equation one. We want to know whether equation one was over identified, was exactly identified, or it was under identified. So now, when I take these three equations, the total number of variables available are five. Let's see. I have y, c, i, and I have g, and I have k. So I have one, two, 
three, four, five. So I have five total number of variables. Okay. So in taking equation one, for example, so I want to look out for the number of variables available in equation one. That's my end. So I have four variables. I have Y, C, I, and G. So one, two, three, four. The number of variables available in equation one is four, and that's my M. Okay. And G, the number of structural equations or the number of equations, have equation one, equation two, so I have three. Now, when I compare the number of variables excluded in equation one and the number of equations in minus one, so K minus one being my number of variables excluded, so K minus one is five, it's um, five minus four, K minus N, five minus four, I end up getting one. Then G, that's three minus one. Three minus one, I end up getting two. So what do you see here? You see the number of variables excluded in equation one being less than the number of equations minus one, that's two. And this indicates underlying identification. Similarly, when I take equation two, the total number of variables available is three was five. The number of variables available in equation three are just two. That is C and Y, so they are just two. The number of equations, the sequence of equations, or the structural equations are still same. So when I do my comparison, that is comparing the variables that are in equation two to the number of equations minus one. When I do that comparison, k minus one, that's the number of variables excluded in equation two. Five minus two is three. K minus one, that's three minus one, which is two. What do we see here? The number of variables excluded in equation two are less are uh, greater than the number of equations minus one. So this makes it or this makes equation two over identified. So I know with this we all would understand. So the same thing, the same procedure you compare and you can see equation three will give us two two. So when they are the same, when you get the number of uh, variables excluded in a given equation being equal to the number of variables, so the number of equations minus one, then we have exact identification. So here we end up getting two, two. the number of variables excluded in equation there was two, and g minus one was also two, so it was exactly identified. So you can do same for this one, the same procedure. K minus M, that's the number of variables excluded in equation one, K minus one. K minus one, that's the number of equations minus one, that's two minus one. Then I'm getting one, and this shows an exact identification. When I take equation two, when I take equation two, K minus M, that's the number of equations excluded in equation two. K minus one, the number of equations minus one. I had two, that's the number of uh, equations excluded in equation two, and the number of equations minus one. So two was greater than one, which shows it was over identification. So this ends this tutorial. So now, what the identification problem tends to do is that using the order rule, okay, it's just trying to compare the number of variables in a given equation to the number of equations minus one. Whenever you have the number of variables in a given equation being greater than the number of equations minus one, you have over identification. And whenever we have the number of, um, whenever you have the number of variables excluded in a given equation being less than the number of equations minus one, we have under identification. But when we have the number of variables excluded in equation, being equal to the number of equations minus one, they have exact identification. So this ends our tutorial for today. Can you like, subscribe, and share if you have any questions to forward it to the number? Let's see. Thank you.